Okay. So in this uh, video lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, RNNs, which stand for Recurrent Neural Networks. RNNs are a, a type of uh, deep learning uh, neural network architectures that are suitable for processing sequences. So what do you mean by sequences uh, is any ordered collection of uh, numerical data. Now, for example, here we see it's the stock price of a certain company as a function of time. So the y-axis is the stock price or it could be stock index, um, anything of that sort. But uh, nevertheless, it's a function of time. It's varying over time. Uh, another example of a time series data is, for example, speech signal. Uh, you know, you, you, as you speak, you know, you, you're uttering certain senses, sentences uh, which basically get mapped into some sort of an amplitude. Uh, here I have a hypothetical um, envelope for H, letter H and E. So if you are pronounce like say a word called hello, it might look like this. So uh, Y is basically the amplitude of the speech signal and X axis is basically time. Um, there are other kinds of uh, sequences which don't have uh, uh, the behavior like you have seen above. Um, you know, particularly in the, in the context of language processing, we can see that um, even words, uh, a sentence is nothing but an ordered collection of words. So we have a notion of time uh, in discrete units. For example, you have, here I have a you know, sentence or a paragraph, lorem, ipsum, doxum, jixum, the cat, sort and the mat, kalakanidi, viluvainidi. Uh, so here, for example, my first word, why not, is a lorem, why one is basically ipsum. And finally, why get is when it's progressing over time, you see the yt plus one is a, is a word. Uh, so in that sense, you can see that language is also uh, you know, a type of a signal or a type of a sequence. Um, and not every time a sequence has to be uh, uh, related to time uh, domain. For example, you can uh, you know, see space, space also as a function of uh, you know, like an ordered uh, uh, variable or ordered data. So uh, when we want to you know, apply RNNs to sequences, now what are the you know, classical or you know, the traditional way of dealing with sequences? Let's say in this case you have a stock series or a stock price of a certain company. Uh, my interest is to know what would be the stock price now, now given that I have observations about the same uh, company uh, historically speaking. So given the last one week's uh, historical stock index or stock price, uh, can I know something about it right now? So the interest is basically in making predictions. That's one. In the case of a speech signals, uh, my interest is to, uh, for example, what letter was spoken. Now, given ha having access to the amplitude uh, amplitude signal, uh, can I infer the uh, letter or a word spoken by a person? And now that's interest coming from speech signal. In the context of language, for example, uh, let's say I want to annotate uh, the text data with a part of speech. Um, uh, for example, uh, I could have a word like uh, the cat sat on the mat. So what is the POS stack for a cat? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an article? Is it a preposition? So that's my interest. Uh, so just uh, stepping, back, stepping back a little bit, how do we model such sequences um, now that are uh, related to time? Time could be either real or notional. I have a very simple model. This is called autoregressive model in the context of time series data, where I see that yt is basically some function of yt minus one. Uh, in this case, it's a scalar multiple of the previous uh, you know, observation I have, plus there is some measurement error, right? Yt is equal to a times yt minus one plus error. So if I know yt minus one, I simply multiply that with a scalar, I am getting some yt. So then the interest is to know what that A is. Now that pretty much determines uh, your model. That's what we mean by model. Um, well, this might work for some, side of, some uh, type of uh, you know, signals, like uh, you know, certain kind of time series data. But I might have access to some other latent, uh, not, not actually ac access to, but let's say I could have a different generative model, where I assume that you now y, y t is the response are simply observations uh, which are manifestations of some latent state, which I don't observe, but I like to know, right? For example, the other model I propose in this case is to have, let's say, there is a latent state for which I don't have direct access to, but the, nevertheless, the observations are produced by that particular state. So I do say that xt is b times xt minus 1 plus some error, 
then my observations are really a function of the state. So if I know xt, I pretty much know yt, just the previous model, uh, a simple autoregressive model that we talked about a while ago. So, so it typically you call these xt's as uh, you no know, latent states. Therefore, the model uh, that uh, uh, that uh, models the current state xt as a function of the historical states is the state evolution model. And given the uh, ac given access to the states, now how do you model the observations? That's called the observation model. This is a classical linear time state linear um, you no know, state space models. Um, now, for example, you can immediately see that uh, this is a and a continuous time marker model. And if I if I discretize my time steps, now you can immediately begin to see that this is a special case of uh, hidden marker models or a special case of this particular model. Um, I could make the uh, example a lot more concrete by uh, uh, take, talking about uh, POS tagging. Uh, now, for example, uh, the observations are basically the sentences or the words, like uh, you have access to the words, which are basically the observations the cat sat on the mat. So this is the first word, second word, third word, so on and so forth. Yt is the uh, a mat. But you assume that there is a latent state, uh, which in this case happens to be the part of speech tagging. So what you're saying is that, let's say given the latent access to the latent state, uh, x1 is basically the latent state corresponding to the observation y1. Uh, so if, let's say I know that uh, the latent state at this time x1 equals to 80 article, what is likely to follow? In other words, we are asking the question, what is the probability of, let's say, x2 taking a type of a pure stack given that the previous stack was 80? So in all likelihood, I can say that it is not going to be an article. That means I don't see two articles followed by, like a, the. I don't say uh, a, the cat. Now, I might say the cat, uh, uh, which, um, uh, uh, the cat sat, but I don't, I'm not going to say a the cat, right? Uh, generally, two articles don't occur uh, uh, almost never. Um, so that's what basically this latent state model is going to say. Now, given uh, likewise, you can say that now given that my previous uh, two tags are an article and the noun, um, what is going to be my uh, my now tag at the uh, x3? Now, could it be noun or do I say, for example, the cat the? It's not going to happen, right? Therefore, syntactically, just by looking at the pure stacks, you know, you can pretty much figure out uh, what is a likely uh, syntactical tag that the word belongs to. Now, given that, what word can it take? Right? Now, that's how you can train your model. So, our interest was to having observed the words, what, what prediction can I make about the tag? Uh, uh, in this case, if I know the cat sat and the first two uh, pure stacks are uh, article and noun, uh, I can say that the probability of the third word uh, belonging to uh, a verb is a lot more likely than it belonging to, let's say, noun. And it is possible, uh, but nevertheless, it, it can occur with very low probability. Uh, that is a classical example or application of a hidden marker model to POS tagging. And we see that hidden marker models is a you know, special type of uh, linear state space model. So consequently, uh, but the underneath assumptions are as follows. Uh, so the current state, the current hidden state depends on only the previous state. This is called the first order Marco assumption, right? Uh, ideally, we like to condition the current uh, state's probability on all the history. But uh, remember in which case the model can become very complex. So the simplification that we could do is to assume that the current state depends only on the previous state. So that's a first order Marco assumption. Uh, uh, it greatly simplifies your model. In, the, in other words, the number of parameters will be substantially smaller. If not, uh, the parameter space is going to be exponential in the dimensions or in the number of levels that each uh, you no know, POS stack can take. Likewise, on the observation side, we are saying that the current state, the current observation only depends on the, pre, the, the current uh, state. So even though you have access to all the historical data, both in terms of observations as well as in terms of the latent state, you simply say that my yt, the observation at the time t, depends only on the latent state at time t. Uh, this again uh, is a distributional assumption that you make to simplify your model. Uh, well, uh, these linear models are very popular. Linear time systems are very popular because you now they have efficient parameterizations and they're very suitable uh, and they're good for certain types of data. Now, obviously, you know, not every model works for every data. 
So uh, now depending on the problem, you might, you might need to relax these assumptions, uh, which is where, for example, RNNs come, in, come into play. Right? Uh, now let's go back to uh, RNNs. Having understood the motivation for uh, modeling sequences, how they have been dealt with traditionally uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, state space systems is what we have seen. Then we'll see uh, how RNNs fit. For example, just the way, you now for example, we can see that you know, the traditional you know, uh, uh, feed forward neural networks or generalization of the classical vanilla you know, perceptron. Perceptron is nothing but um, a logistic regression in disguise. In that way, you can see that uh, feed forward neural networks um, are generalization of uh, you know, regular linear models. Just the way, um, even RNNs can be seen as a generalization of uh, classical linear dynamical systems. So what, do, what, what, what are the limitations? Uh, and now definitely, uh, the previous models that we talked about made very simple assumptions, you know, the first order marker assumptions. And we could make further implications on the uh, linearity part of it. So uh, we like to extend our models to incorporate non-linearities, uh, break away the first order marker assumption, and we need compositional, uh, compositionality. We like our models to be compositional in nature. That means uh, 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 using a very small, uh, rather very, now specific building blocks, I like to recursively compute uh, compose functions. Just the way uh, we could take a, you know, a, a, a perceptron as a building block and come up with different layers. Uh, that gives an extensibility in terms of how complex your model can be. And, uh, and naturally deal with different kinds of input output pairs. Now for example, I could, I want to let's say predict, uh, uh, predict uh, next word, uh, given let's say set of words, that's a classification problem. I like to do machine, trans machine language translation. That means I have sequence in, I want to have sequence out. So you want to model different kinds of situations in which you know, sequences are at play, both on the input side as well as on the output side. And now in that sense, RNNs are very flexible uh, in terms of uh, dealing with or breaking away from the linearity assumptions, breaking away from the first order mark assumptions, and breaking away from the restrictions imposed by the linear models in terms of compositionality of the models. So, while that seems to be the general goal, let's uh, talk simple. Let's come with a, let's talk about a very simple uh, RNN. In this case, R stands for recurrent neural networks. As the, na as the name implies, we repeat the same block. So you have an input state S0. S0 is, let's say, the initial state. Uh, X1 is basically the input. And uh, now, uh, given S0 and X1, we like to make a prediction about the state S1. S1 is basically propagated to the next state and so on and so forth. So it's exactly the same block that is, uh, that is uh, recursively, rather repeatedly applied. That's why it's called recurrent neural networks. And uh, the simplified block uh, schematic of the uh, architecture shown here is this. Uh, if you go from this to this, that's called graph unrolling. So this uh, square dot represents a delay element. That means uh, this particular node takes a delayed version of the state ST, that means ST is basically a function of uh, ST minus 1 and XT. So what goes in uh, will determine what kind of a RNN you are talking about. So there could be different modules uh, or different cells you know, that can model you know, ST as a function of ST minus 1 and XT. That's a simple uh, RNN for you. Uh, since we are talking about neural networks, we'll make uh, the model a lot more concrete. So we are saying that ST is basically some function, some non-linear function of uh, xt and st minus 1. In the regular parlance of uh, no, uh, neural networks, this wx is basically the weight matrix uh, that maps xt to uh, the, the uh, no, hidden state st. Likewise, there is a mapping between st and st minus 1, which is basically wh, and b happens to be the bios term. And uh, this f is generally the activation function. So in some sense, you can say that these are all the activators, and this is the activation function. This is what you like to uh, model. And notice, uh, though, is that uh, all the wx, wh, and b are shared across timestamps. That means if there is a parameter that maps x input x1 to s1 uh, or uh, as a function of s0, if you call that as wx, that same wx is basically uh, uh, repeated across all the blocks. In that sense, uh, the same parameter basically dri is, uh, drives all the different states. Uh, so there is a notable difference between regular feedforward neural networks and recurrent neural networks. Um, uh, so whether whether it's uh, no DNNs, no uh, in this case RNNs or the classical uh, no uh, linear time systems or uh, uh, let me ro just roll back and say that in general, this is what we are trying to say. 
my current observation yt is basically some function of the historical observations all including up to timestamp t minus 1 and having access to all the historical uh, you know, uh, latent states including the current one x1 to t. So I need a mapping, I need a function. I am saying that my yt is basically some function of the historical observations as well as all the uh, latent states up until now. And likewise, you are trying to model the latent states as a function of all the historical latent states. What those f and g? Um, now you can uh, definitely extend the linear time state, uh, linear uh, no, dynamical systems to include uh, to include nonlinear state space systems. Uh, for example, we use particle filters as a way to infer uh, this w, this f and g uh, given y t and the modeling assumptions you have about f and g. But the problem with uh, any of the inferential techniques like particle filters or sequential Monte Carlo, uh, regular Mar Marco chain Monte Carlo is that uh, there could be problem with long range dependence. Uh, in, in, in that sense, now when you are repeatedly sampling and going backwards in time, the particles could become degenerate. In the sense, your model is not going to learn anymore. The same problem happens in RNNs too. In the simple, uh, when you have a simple RNN, uh, you are going to obviously you are going to use back propagation as an efficient algorithm to infer uh, the RNN parameters. Uh, because back propagation is, is uh, nothing but uh, application of a chain rule of uh, differentiation. So, uh, uh, so a very simple uh, example of that, uh, the problem with back, back, back propagation when you have a deep layers is that uh, the gradients could vanish. What it means, what I meant to say is that if there is a, some constant, if you are repeatedly multiplying the same constant, uh, so if you have something like a to the power of p and a is less than 1 and p is much greater than 1, then a to the power of p will be substantially a. In fact, it, it could get uh, uh, close to 0 very rapidly depending on how small your a is. That means your gradients will be vanishing. If your gradients are disappearing, that means that you are not learning the model. So the model becomes become saturated. The other problem that you could have with uh, back propagation is that when the gradients could explode. Just the way when a is much smaller than 1, the effectively a to the power of p can become much smaller and close to 0. Likewise, a to the power of p can, uh, can be much, much larger than 1. That's called gradient explosion. So these are the two problems that could happen when you are building RNNs uh, that needs to remember uh, uh, you know, past. Uh, so how do we model, how do you actually tackle this problem? Now, there are a lot of efficient methods to uh, address particle attrition uh, when you are trying to uh, infer nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, consequently, for RNNs, there is a different techniques. Uh, and one such technique, or rather one such building block in RNNs uh, that can deal with uh, 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 this long-range dependence and, gra uh, and vanishing, vanishing gradients is called a gate and recurrent unit. So, architecturally speaking, uh, the gate and recurrent unit has some kind of a memory. Right? If you see this as a logical uh, uh, IC, like integrated chip, you got basically three inputs, that's ST-1, HT-1 and XT. XT is basically your current, current input and it's, these are the two access to the two internal, internal states which you maintain, ST-1 and HT-1. These are hidden state that are recursively propagated. And the Z and R are like a temporary variables that are specific to that particular cell and ST and HT are the latent uh, no states uh, which propagated to the next cell because in, in RNNs we repeatedly or recursively or recurrently uh, daisy chain uh, these functional blocks. So the getting recurrent unit uh, uses this kind of uh, uh, mapping internally. It's like it's like a neural network, but but a cell. We call this as a cell, right? Now you see that, for example, in the case in the case of a getting recurrent unit, the current state uh, st is basically some weighted combination of uh, because you see that this is like one minus z times st minus one plus z times h, and this indicates uh, element-wise uh, product. So, if all the STs are basically scalar variables, you, for all practical purposes, you can see that ST is basically a weighted combination of the previous state versus the current state. So, you have ST minus 1 times uh, uh, the, the Z variable plus 1 minus Z, uh, rather 1 minus Z times the previous state plus uh, Z times H. So, strictly speaking, it's exactly like uh, it's a, a weighted average between the previous state versus the current uh, hidden state that you maintain. And Z, Z, Z and R are like the temporary variables. Uh, uh, they have uh, the sigmoid activation function. The internal state H T uses a tan H activation function. The uh, architecturally these are kind of very similar. You have uh, uh, the Z is basically determined or driven by uh, the input as well as the previous state. Even R is also driven by the, pre uh, the current state and the previous state. 
and HT is basically driven by the current input and uh, uh, previous uh, uh, internal state. Okay, but how do you understand this? Now, why is it different? How does it handle vanishing gradients? How does it remember? So for that, we actually operate in the boundary conditions. What I mean by boundary conditions is that, so uh, as the name implies, gate and recurrent unit, something it means that it is acting like a gate, like a logical gate. Uh, even though we are operating on the continuous spaces, uh, for the purpose of illustration, rather rather for the purpose of discussion, uh, we like to operate in the boundary conditions. We pretend that Z and R are like discrete logic gates. So, uh, how does it happen? Uh, if you look at it, <clears throat> uh, for example, the, the sigmoid is basically kind of a squeezing function. So, it, uh, it maps the real line to uh, 0 to 1. Uh, uh, so, sigmoid is basically uh, turns any real value input to onto an interval uh, in a number between 0 and 1, right? Uh, in that sense, you can see that if uh, on the extreme case, you know, let's say if my all practical purposes, if my input is let's say less than minus 8, uh, it's going to be mapped to minus uh, 0. If my input is let's say more than plus 8, then it's going to uh, plus 1, very close to plus 1. Practically, I, treat the, I can treat that as plus 1. Uh, um, and in that sense, uh, the sigmoid function basically turns a given input into uh, discrete states on the extremum or, or rather on the boundary points. So I can see that uh, when xt and w are sufficiently large, so that z can be seen as operating on either 0 or 1, likewise r is also operating on the two discrete uh, outputs like 0 and 1. So that's how I can treat uh, uh, for the purpose of analysis as z and r are some kind of a discrete logic states. And how do you, uh, what determines those logic states? Obviously, it de depends on the inputs, xt, the previous states, as well as the, the coefficients that the uh, RNN learns, right? So, to simplify the analysis, I'll treat xt, w's, all of them as basically scalars. And the interesting property of tan h is, by the way, both tan h and sigma are related. So, tan h is basically rescaled version of the sigmoid function. Nevertheless, the interesting property of tan h is that you now tan h approximately behaves as an identity transformation in a certain interval. So, that means uh, tan h definitely maps your input uh, to minus one, minus 1 to 1, but it, it acts like uh, tan h is approximately equal to x when x is uh, in the interval of, let's say, you know, minus 1 to 1. So, if my inputs are sufficiently close or sufficiently bounded below and above uh, by minus 1 and 1, then I can ignore the tan h function and simply treat my ht as you no know, simply uh, an identity transformation. So, ht becomes xt times w plus ht minus 1 element wise multiplication of r multiplied by wr. So, this becomes like night transformation. That leads us to uh, do a simple analysis and understand the behavior of the gate and recurrent unit. Let's do that. So, uh, because I was saying that this, I can treat this Z and R as uh, discrete gates, uh, I like to come up with a truth table. Let's see, you now uh, for a moment, and, uh, assume that both XT, W, all of them are scalars and the sigmoid basically acts on the boundary conditions. Uh, in other words, I have, my, I have my X and W such that uh, for a given set of inputs, uh, the sigma turns the input signal into either 0 or 1. Right, so I, I pretend that I'm observing both Z and R uh, on the discrete scale. So if uh, let's say that Z and R are, for example, zero and zero. If my Z and R are zero and zero, what happens to ST? If ST uh, becomes uh, simply ST minus one because Z is equal to zero, I don't have any contribution from this guy. So for for Z equals zero and R equals zero, um, basically my ST is simply ST minus one. And what happens to my HT? Because my R is basically zero, I don't have any contribution from here. Uh, this tan H is treated as identity transformation, so H T becomes X T times W H. For this, this for the purpose of discussion, I say that W X H is basically one. So H T is nothing but X T. Uh, so that's what I see. If my uh, Z is equal to zero, R is equal to zero, no H T simply becomes X T. That means it's simply copying the input. Uh, and the uh, no, ST is simply copying the previous state, ST minus 1. My current hidden state, HT, is basically simply the input itself. That's interesting to, uh, uh, to, uh, to observe. Like this, what happens if my Z is equal to 0 and R equals to 1? Remember, no, ST only depends on uh, Z, right? Particularly when you're operating on the boundary conditions. If Z is equal to 0, ST is always ST minus 1. So if, uh, if Z equals 0, ST is basically ST minus 1. It remains the same. But what happens to HT? Because now R equals to 1, 
Uh, so I have w, let's I assume that w x h equals to 1 and w r h equals to 1 and tan h is 90 transformation. So h t is nothing but x t plus h t minus 1. That's what I see here. So if my z is equal to 0 and r equals to 1, my h t is basically x t plus h t minus 1. It, what, is, what is happening now is that uh, it's a, uh, the previous state is actually adding up to the current state. It's acting like an accumulator. So x t input is basically getting added to previous state. Let's see what happens when uh, z equals to 1 and r is equal to 0. So based on this truth table, when z equals to 1, we see that uh, st becomes ht. Uh, so you see that uh, when z equals to 1, you no know, st becomes ht. And when r is equal to 0, we, and, we, know, we already computed that, so it becomes x, uh, xt. So given z is equal to 0 and r equals to 1, you can compute the rest of the truth table. Now what's interesting see, is that let's play this uh, you know, state machine in time. So what I'm going to do is that I simply I'm going to observe what would be my ST, HT and XT. So XT is basically given, these are my observations. If X1, X2, X3 are basically given to you and you start with some initial state S0, H0 and X0, then um, if Z equals 0, R equals 0. If you play the same, uh, if, if the same state is maintained for a while, what's going to be your output? So from this truth table, you know that when Z equals 0 and R equals 0, uh, basically your ST is nothing but ST minus 1. So your, your S1 basically simply S, S0 and in this case S2 is basically S1, S1 is basically S0. Therefore, as long as you are in the same state, Z is equal to 0 and R equals 0, the current state simply is a copy of S0. So you see that same state S0, S0, S0 appearing. It's like it's, mem it's remembering. It's remembering the hidden state you know, for, a, for a certain period of time as long as Z is equal to 0 is observed. When what happens to the hidden state H0, HT? Remember when uh, r is equal to 0, the current state is basically, current hidden state is basically xt, so it's simply copying the input. So it's basically forgetting the what the previous hidden state was and it's simply trying to remember the just now movement, which is the current input. So what's interesting to happen is, one guy remembers the historical um, you know, context second time, it's not getting updated, the other guy is basically simply learning the just the current, it's, it's remembering the entire uh, past. Uh, that's interesting. No. Now let's switch one. It let's flip one gate. Since so let's keep z is equal to zero and simply turn uh, r equals zero to r equals to one. So I have my x four or x five or x six such that r is basically turned on. What happens when you go from this particular state zero zero to zero one is uh, obviously uh, z the s t is not going to change because you still have z is equal to zero. Therefore uh, the current current state is simply uh, S0. It's referring to uh, referring to uh, S0 in time, like S0. So it's simply getting copied. What is interesting happening is the interesting happening is that uh, HT. Remember when uh, R equals to one, it is acting like an accumulator. XT plus HT minus one. So my XT is basically X4. What is my HT? HT is basically X3. Therefore, it is actually adding X3 to X4. That's my hidden state. It's uh, it's exactly like an accumulator. And suppose if you play forward in time by one time step, uh, one time stamp, you are at t equals to 5. And still our state is equal to 0 equal to 0, therefore you sim simply get copied, uh, the S, S5 is nothing but S0. And since this is an accumulator, it's adding all the inputs uh, from time stamp 3 all the way up to the current stamp, which is basically 5. So you see that it's like an accumulator, x3, 4, uh, it's a summation of all the inputs from 3 to 4, then summation of inputs from 3 to 5, from summation of inputs from 3 to 6. Now let's uh, uh, change the input uh, by one more state. So now instead of uh, z is equal to 0, let's flip this gate uh, z from 0 to 1. So now I'm in the state where both gates are on. When my both gates are on, uh, what is happening is because uh, when z equals to 1 and the current state st is nothing but ht, so it basically simply copies the current hidden state. It's actually forgetting what, the, it's forgetting the past. and. Uh, uh, again, uh, there is nothing happened to r equals to 1, so it is the same state, therefore uh, ht continues to be an accumulator. And what is happening to my hidden state st is that it is simply copying my ht state. So what you notice in this case is that uh, the hidden state s7 equals to accumulation of x3 to x7, my hidden state uh, s8 is uh, accumulator of uh, accumulation of inputs from x3 to x8. So that is the behavior. Now I, you, you hold for a moment and see what's going to happen. Just play it in your head. Uh, instead of let's go from z equals to 1 or r equals to 1 to another state. In this case, I'm actually flipping one gate at a time. So let's turn the gate or r gate. 
So uh, because zgate is still the same, it still is copying. Uh, therefore, uh, my current state is not accumulated, but it's still remembering the input. So in this particular, when you are in the state z equals to one and r equals zero, uh, both ST and HD simply maintain the current input. That way, they completely forgot the past. Right? There is no accumulation, there is no remembrance of the inputs from uh, up, up until now. They just remember the current input. So that's how it is selectively forgetting some inputs, selectively forgetting some outputs, depending on your input and the hidden states as well as the parameters of the uh, GRU gate. Uh, that now, uh, now we know why, you know, for example, it could accumulate. Now what we mean by uh, accumulation is that you know, it could maintain long range dependencies. It, depending on which gates are active and for how long, we can see that uh, you can remember the state from as far as 100 time steps in the past. That's possible, you know, given, the, uh, given how we, uh, it plays out in time. And now obviously, it depends on the input. Well, uh, it's, it's good to know that you know, the behavior of the gated recurrent unit by simplifying uh, and making lots of assumptions. Uh, one of the assumptions that we made is that uh, the both Z and R are operating on a discrete scale. But that's not true in reality. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, the truth will be somewhere in between. We know that, for example, Z is, is not typically we would be operating on the 0, 1 scale, but something in between. Exactly, <coughs> in which case, you can see that you know, ST, um, depending on how active the Z signal is, it, either it will, most of the influence comes from the previous state HT or uh, the current hidden state HT or the previous hidden state ST minus 1. Um, it could be, it's, it's like a mixed bag. Uh, uh, the contribution is dependent on the gate, uh, where it is basically operating at. Uh, the other notable exception or rather simplification we have done is we assume that uh, both my XT, all the parameters, etc. are scalars. But typically when you are working with language models, this XT could be your word embedding on a, on a, on a, a hundred dimensional one, one, uh, hundred dimensional embedding. That means your XT is like you have a hundred channels. Remember what happens is that now if your WXTs let's say all are orthogonal, uh, that means it's like a diagonal matrix. Given that let's say you're mapping your input of 100 dimensional input to let's say a 100 dimensional hidden state and if Ws are basically orthogonal, then these logic gates can independently operate or control all of the you know, gates. That means um, you can remember one particular channel from the past, you can remember another channel input from, uh, you can completely forget. Just the way we are seeing uh, just the way one input, uh, a certain type of inputs are completely forgotten, certain type of inputs are remembered by accumulating. accumulating. So this phenomena can happen across channels. So I imagine that in the latent dimensions of let's say a particular word uh, or uh, let's say 100 dimensions, each of those 100 dimensions can be selectively turned on or off uh, depending on <coughs> what those input signals are and how, uh, what those uh, are, uh, W hidden states are. That's one uh, generalization that we can immediately see. Uh, the second uh, obvious uh, generalization is obviously these Ws will be uh, a matrices, these Xts will be uh, uh, vectors, uh, and uh, the sigmas not, may not be completely uh, 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 extreme case. They, no, they don't operate, let's say, they don't observe, they don't map the input values to 0 and 1, but something in between. Um, and uh, uh, Basically, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, by, by making these lots of uh, simplifications, we kind of understand the behavior of the gate and recurrent units. Um, and you can see that gate and recurrent units are a simplified version of what we what are known as LSTMs, uh, a long term, no, sh long term, I forgot, uh, long short term memory architectures. Uh, they are a lot more complex, but the nevertheless, they try to achieve the same uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, basically, it is to selectively remember the past and selectively uh, try to remember the inputs. Uh, the same functionality is achieved by get and recurrent units too. Uh, the next, uh, uh, because we wanted to, we wanted to do the analysis, uh, uh, more of a conceptual analysis, um, we have made lots of simplif simplified assumptions. The other thing that we could have tried is to actually simulate. And uh, simulate the values of ST minus 1, HT minus 1 and XT, assume certain parameters and see basically how these inputs change. Uh, we could have simulated both ST and WT uh, by, by uh, feed forwarding. Just the, just the way you predict uh, no sequences in a typical ordinance. Uh, uh, the simulations are lot, uh, definitely very set of powerful tools. Uh, it requires programming, obviously. Um, I think you know, definitely uh, they provide more insights into the behavior of uh, gate and recurrent units. Gate and recurrent units. Uh, 
Uh, because as I said, on LS streams are definitely more complex than GRUs, and maybe this kind of a simplified analysis is not you know, you know, uh, feasible. It is doable, but it may not be that easy, in which case we could uh, you know, simulate the set of inputs, the behavior of uh, the activation functions and uh, you know, layers on the uh, parameters. You know, for example, what happens is Ws are extremely large. Right, uh, it's as if the parameters themselves are driving uh, the uh, gates. Uh, that means that you you would be learning, you would be producing constants, which is not desirable. So it might give you some insights into uh, looking at the stability of your inferential algorithms too. Uh, that 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 could be a possibility. So uh, uh, that's all. Uh, basically, uh, both LSTMs and get units are the bread and butter of uh, uh, RNN uh, layers. Uh, just the way con convolution layers, max pooling layers are the bread and butter of uh, uh, convolutional uh, architectures. Um, so depending on the output or the primary task of an RNNs, you need to have, uh, you could have many outputs, you don't have any outputs or you, know, you could have different loss functions driving uh, the parameter learning. So that's, uh, that's on the, uh, no, what, what, what task uh, these RNNs are being used for, that they depend on that. Uh, uh, that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.